Good morning, everyone, and welcome back from the Easter break. I'm David Stevenson and uh, your host. Welcome to the Festival of Enterprise COVID-19 webinar series. Uh, I'm joined this morning by uh, Glenn Waters and Ed Reed from the RAISE team at PwC. Um, Glenn is the head of the RAISE team, Ed, the manager of the RAISE team. They'll be taking us through a presentation today on COVID-19's impact on venture investments. Um, so the RAISE team support fast growth businesses raising institutional investment from over 400 venture funds. They have recently conducted a flash survey of, venture, of, of, our, of their venture network to understand the impact of COVID-19 uh, is likely to have on venture markets, um, which include discussions with interest, industry bodies such as the BVCA and the British Business Bank. The session will allow um, our viewers to have the opportunity to discuss with them uh, their views on how different types of institutional investors are reacting to COVID-19. So, gentlemen, thank you very much for, for joining us this morning, and uh, we're delighted to have you. And with that, I will hand it over to you. Uh, we'll be doing a, uh, they'll be taking us through a brief presentation, and then we'll open it up to, to questions afterwards. Well, thank you. Cheers. Um, hi, hi there, sorry. Um, so yeah, just a brief introduction. Ed Reed, uh, manager of the race team at PwC. Um, good, to, good to be here. Um, thought we'd just start by just giving a bit of background about what uh, the, the team that Glenn and I work in essentially do. So David uh, uh, sort of introduced it well. We support fast growth businesses raising institutional investment. Um, and we typically work in a range from about 1 million through to 30 million. So sort of series A being growth capital. Um, we do this in three ways. So we'll help our clients get investor ready with their investor documents. Um, we'll facilitate um, warm introductions to our quite wide investor network and um, support on the term sheet negotiations as well when it comes to closing the deal. Um, and the way in which we work is sort of divided into two. So at a series A level, from one through to five million. Um, we work through a cohort program, so a series of structured workshops, which ends in a, a large investor day. I think in our last investor day, we had about 90 to 100 different investors represented there. So we've got some, some, good, some good traction there. Um, and then for the larger raises, so sort of series B and beyond, we, we have a one-to-one -one bespoke support uh, uh, system in place. Um, and one of the interesting things that we that we found since we started this um, the, the team a few years ago was, um, you know, you could be a really good business and you have a really good idea, a really good business model, etc. But it's actually one of the key things that we found was around the second element of our support. So where we found that actually having the, the warm introductions are really, really vital to getting investment. And actually, this was backed up by a survey run by the British Business Bank a couple of years ago, um, which found that. 82% of pitch, pitch decks that receive investment were a result of warm introductions. So um, just something to sort of bear in mind, actually, it's a really key element of, of, of facilitating a, a, a strong fundraise and, and getting the result that you want. Um, I'm just going to pass over to Glenn now. Thank you. Um, before we get into our survey, I thought it'd be interesting just to show you this graph. So this is some data we've taken from a company called Bohurst. And it just shows the growth in venture capital from 2011 to 2019. And what you can see there is the phenomenal growth, particularly in seed, series A um, and growth. So that, that end of the market we're talking about today, but you can see it stabilized around 3.94 billion um, 2018, 2019, that's series A. And particularly look at the seed, so those young entrepreneurial companies, we were down at 0 0.2, 0 0.3 billion in 2011, now we're at 1.2, 1.1 billion. I thought that's an interesting snapshot of the venture market. So market grown, um, Next slide, please. Ed. Having said that, so what this graph shows, this is showing quarterly performance. So the bars are showing quarterly um, investment in 2018 and 2019. Um, and the line shows the number of deals. 
The thing which was concerning for me, and this is all pre-COVID, is in 2018, we had just over 6.2 thousand deals. Um, now that declined in 2019 to 5.9. What does that indicate? That indicates that invest some investors are becoming more risk averse, and therefore some of those early stage businesses which would have got investment um, might not have got it going forward. And this again is all pre-COVID. Um, so something to have watched out. Of. And obviously you can see Q120, um, so that line there where deals have fallen, and obviously that takes into account the COVID scenario. If we move on to the survey. So that, that just gives you a bit of context of the wider market. So what we did is we thought, well, what, what is the impact of COVID on venture capital? So we did a snapshot survey where we polled 84 um, what we're calling venture investors. So VCs, VCTIS funds, corporate venture capital, family office, and a handful of venture debt providers. We did that in the space of three days in late March, and really to get a sense of really to get a sense of what what the market was telling us. So the impact of COVID-19 on investment activity. So what did investors say? So 90% said there'd be an impact on investment activity. Um, so 67 said a partial impact and 23% significant impact. Then we asked the question, where was the attention going to be focused during COVID-19? Were investors still open for business? Now, 73% did say they were open for business, focusing both their current portfolio and new opportunities. To be seen what new opportunities means, um, let's wait and see. Now, qualitatively, when I've spoken to my investor network, what they're telling me is, yes, they're open for business, um, but processes are gonna take longer, um, they're gonna be more cautious, and they're going to focus on shoring up their portfolio to so where they've got companies in their portfolio who need cash that's going to be the priority going forward for the immediate future um, so the next couple of questions focused on around deal volumes and ticket sizes so we asked what extent would covid19 impact deal volumes and you can see over 70% said a high and significant impact. Um, surprisingly though, on the size of tickets, yes, 14% said significant impact and 43% said high impact. You've got over 40% there who said minimum, minimal to medium impact, which I found very interesting. So if I look at those two graphs together, what we're saying is volumes are going down, but ticket sizes, aren't going down as drastically. And that could be for a number of reasons. That could be where some of the VCT and EIS funds, as an example, have capital to deploy. And once they've shored up their portfolio, they do need to spend. Um, yeah. um, next slide, Ed. Thank you. Um, I'm really interested. The, the killer question is impact on valuations. So what you can see there is a significant number said greater than so 90% said valuations would take a 20% plus haircut, um, and a 24% said 30% plus. So give that some context. And a couple of live transactions we recently completed on. Um, of the three transactions, two of them did take a 30 to 35% haircut, and one of them on their term sheet, the um, liquidation preference was changed. So, again, speaking to my investor network, they are saying, look, the stock market is down that amount. We have to rep reprice our asset class. Therefore, valuations are not going to be as punchy as they were in the past. So the key, key question going forward, is this a rebase of valuations? So is for the next six, 12, two years, are now valuations got 
been reset to a new norm. Then the, the chart on the right hand side says, where do you see opportunities being presented as a road of COVID-19? Unsurprisingly, the investor network said health and ed tech were the ones with two biggest opportunities. And we're, we're seeing that ourselves in the companies we're looking at. Um, and as you expect, real estate and consumer are the ones being significantly impacted. Thanks, Len. Um, so then we just wanted to, to sort of finally touch on before we open it to Q&A, how this is impacting different um, sort of investor types, because we've seen the, the results en masse when they were all grouped together, but there's some interesting insights from the different types of investor as well. So um, the one thing, uh, to note on is that I think Glenn touched on obviously the higher um, sort of concentration of capital pre-COVID being in the sort of growth series B investment um, uh, investment space um, and actually from the results of our survey we could see that they were a lot more bullish um, compared to some of the early stage investors um, and who were a bit more pessimistic about the you know the, the chances of the, the market bouncing back and the impact on the deal volumes, valuations and ticket sizes. So that was one really interesting insight to come out of it. Um, and then in terms of the individual sort of sectors of investors, if you will, we sort of divide it up between VC funds, VCs and the IS funds, family offices and corporate ventures. So with the VC funds, the, the way that we think this might play out is that there's likely to be um, a decrease in the number of exits over the next sort of year or so, even maybe a bit longer, um, or at least a delay. Um, they, they'll want to try and see if the market will bounce back so they can get the best price for their for their portfolio companies on exit. So that's, that's unsurprising. Um, and also some of the um, commitments from the limited partners may decrease as well. You know, asset prices will decrease, so they'll sort of see less need to to, to plug in quite as much uh, uh, capital as well into the VC funds. Um, maybe we'll touch on some of this in the in the Q and A. But one of the interesting things in developing stories is that the BVCA is currently lobbying um, the the government to um, relax some of the rules around C bills. Um, to help their portfolio companies. I think at the moment they're really struggling to, to access it because of various reasons. The two um, most important being that a lot of the early stage tech companies are loss making and therefore not seen as, as viable companies. Um, and then there's also some sort of technicalities and rules around um, the amount of equity um, held by sort of PE funds, et cetera, um, which makes them makes a lot of the portfolio companies not qualifying for the C-bills. Um, and the other development story, of course, is around the um, the proposal to set up a sort of a relief fund in the form of uh, sort of five to six hundred million of convertible um, convertible debt that they're mm -hmm. lobbying the government for. But I'm sure we'll probably touch on that in some of the Q and A as well. So that, that's the sort of developing story there. Um, so we'll we'll see what comes out of that in the coming weeks. Um, the VCTs and the IS funds were again slightly more pessimistic in terms of than the, the, the normal VC funds um, in their outlook. I think the the one of the good things to sort of note upon though and, and positive things is that they are sort of under under strict criteria that they must deploy a certain amount of capital within their cycle. So um, there could potentially be opportunity for investment from there, but also they may choose to deploy that capital in existing portfolio companies. Um, so it's just one to watch out for. Um, and in terms of development from that space, the EISA is the association that represents EIS funds is actually also lobbying the government to relax the rules around EIS criteria. So essentially to try and uh, increase the number of companies that could qualify for EIS, but also to increase the, the, the tax relief that you get on your investment. So at the moment you get sort of 30% initial tax relief. They're looking to increase that temporarily to 60%. Um, and then when you include that with the loss relief that you could that you that you could realise if your investment doesn't go quite as well, um, that does really sort of protect the investor quite a lot. So that's also a developing story. Nothing confirmed there as as of yet, but it is an interesting one. So that could be one to watch out for. Um, so family offices were quite again pessimistic um, in their outlook. Um, 
they, they, they were sort of they saw there would be significant impacts on the venture market as a result of COVID. Um, we would expect that sort of to to uh, continue if, if the crisis worsens. We very unlikely to see a more positive outlook from them. And then with corporate ventures, which is an interesting um, sector of the market, which has obviously had huge global growth in the last ten years. When you think about all the all the, the big players in this market, um, you know, from sort of Salesforce to Big Pharma, as well as oil and gas, they've all got huge corporate venture arms. Um, but you know, that's not limited to the, the traditional players. There's a lot of different corporate ventures out there. Um, in terms of their outlook, they were sort of very, um, very similar to the rest of the investor types. But the the pressure that they'll come under is the the pressure of the the, the corporate that they're sort of nestled within. So typically, what we've seen in previous downturns is that corporates have a, a stick or twist decision to make. So um, essentially, you know, underperforming or potentially newer corporate ventures where the uh the, the group as a whole haven't really seen a, a a return on their venture investments they may be the sort of the first head on the chopping block when it comes to corporate cost reduction programs um but typically for some of the more established players so for example salesforce google etc where they have you know seen positive returns from innovation are very experienced in this market we expect them to continue the course um and to continue uh, sort of investing um subject to all of the other impacts you know ticket sizes going down uh, volumes decreasing etc um it's impacting the other market um but i'm sure we'll see more of that in the in the coming months and seeing how that plays out um great excellent well john thank you very much um well we've got a bit of feedback there for uh for that presentation this morning i mean i think um you did touch on something that i wanted to um to ask you, Ed, which is about um, you know this sort of gap that we're seeing, um, you know, in this in the Seabill scheme, there is certainly you know the, the, the viable business having to show you know profitability is is something that hinders early stage companies. Um, and, you know, clearly, that has a negative impact on growth, uh, you know, for the for the economy as a whole and in the in the sort of startup um, world. And that's something I think that we're you know curious. I think everyone's curious to hear when there'll be something that is that is sort of uh, proposed to address that. I know a lot of the fintechs are, are lobbying hard for um, you know for changes there, but I haven't heard of any sort of real news in that uh, in that space or of any imminent changes. Um, so we're just sort of waiting, I suppose, until that happens. Yeah, the so I know um, the BBCA last week were lobbying the Treasury, and I think it was Wednesday or Thursday a roundtable. Um, of investors also had a call with the Treasury. So I expect in the next week or so we'll hear some news. Um, as, you, as Ed mentioned, the bit the Treasury are trying to get their heads around is on the face of it, these are loss making businesses. And therefore, if they're loss making businesses, do they deserve to be um, bailed out? Uh, so there's been an education going on with the civil service, et cetera. That these are scale-up companies and the growth growth engine for the future of the economy. Ho hopefully, in the next week or so, we'll hear hear an announcement. Okay, thanks for that. Yeah, so I think everyone's uh, you know waiting um, waiting for that. And uh, yeah, as you say, I mean these are the sort of growth companies, and obviously their model requires them to be loss making in the first couple of years to be able to be um, you know to provide that growth for the future. Um, thanks for that. So we have uh, we have questions starting to come through now um we have a question here from charlie uh wondering if you had a view as to whether the government uh, might perhaps consider increasing the annual and or lifetime vct investment limits into in, sorry vct investment limits into companies that help encourage alternative funding to civils etc during the current covid 19 situation even if only temporary um, so yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. So yes, again, that's one of the things being lobbied at the moment. So um, I think a lot of the reliefs the lobbying for will be temporary. Um, but yeah, that that is on the table as well. Okay. Um, sorry, we've got a someone's screen is freezing. If your if your screen is freezing or you can't hear, please uh, please try refreshing your browser. Um, that usually sorts out. Uh, this this problem. 
I think the internet is um, is struggling under the weight of everyone uh, being at home and using it uh, in a very different way at the moment. Um, so thanks for that, um, Glenn. We have uh, another question here. Uh, have you had any experience of banks rejecting CBILS applications from VCPE-backed companies uh, where the VCP house has a majority investment on the basis of the Sybil's yes, group threshold turnover being exceeded when combining the turnover of the various portfolio companies? Again, yes. Um, so they, they are getting caught under those thresholds. So as part of the BVCA, um, so this is the British Fence Venture Capital Association. Um, if you have a look at their webcast they did last week, this was brought up. Um, so again, if you, if you stand back, the Treasury's got a lot to deal with, um, and this is a niche part of the market. And the people, the people, um, the civil service, the, the people there are needing an, a bit of education of what our market is about. Um, so yes, companies are getting caught on, under those rules, so they will need to be flexed for this end of the market for the scheme to work properly. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, just to add on that as well. I think one of the interesting stats that came out of that webcast was um, the BBCA is surveying, um, you know, their business and trying to get feedback on on how how things are developing for them. Um, and the most recent survey of investors covered about seven hundred portfolio companies, and of those seven hundred, um, only twenty nine have sort of been successfully given access to the CBIL scheme. That doesn't mean all seven hundred have applied for it and therefore most have been rejected but only 29 have actually sort of threaded the needle so I think there is clearly issues in terms of access there and so as Glenn said it's a developing story and I'm sure we'll see more coming out in the next couple of weeks. Okay, excellent. Um, we have another question um, from John asking whether there will be a further shift towards B2B businesses uh, what does this mean for investors who are predispositioned to consumers, etc.? Um, it's a good question. I mean, when when we look at our investor base and what we see in terms of deals done, the majority are B two B. It's a fact of life. Um, recurring revenue, stable business model it's an easier asset class to be back in. Now, having said that, there are niche investors who understand the consumer space and when it bounces back, um, there will be those type of investors. But yeah, there, there, there will be a fundamental, let's just say, shift towards B2B. What do I mean by that? If you are a generalist fund, um, where are you gonna put your allocation of investment at the moment? You're gonna put it in the less riskier, sectors um which by definition is your b2b enterprise type companies fair enough thank you um for that so i mean i, I think i mean i guess we're you know we're sort of four weeks into lockdown now and um you know obviously this was a sort of unexpected situation development in the market um so i'd be interested to get your insight into perhaps you know whether I mean, do, do you think the industry in general has been has sort of contingency plans for this? It sounds like capital is being sort of allocated towards, you know, helping businesses uh, where there are already existing investments survive, which obviously is, is a logical, um, you know, course of action. Um, obviously, that will have an impact on 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 the sort of ability to fund future investments. But do, do, is there, you know, I mean, if this could, I mean, obviously it's quite sort of unclear how the situation will develop um, if we sort of emerge in the next couple of months. That will obviously be a relatively short time and presumably people will, will survive relatively well um but if you know we go into this the summer sort of is okay and then it re-emerges in the fall and then everything sort of you know closes down again how much capacity do you think the industry has to weather something like that do you think that we'll see potentially fundamental changes do you have any insights into what people are thinking in the industry and whether there's any sort of concern at the moment or yeah, um, I, I wouldn't say a fundamental change. I think you you correctly point out how long will this last for. Um, there's a lot of capital, you know, we hear that phrase, and the horrible phrase, dry powder, and yeah. there is money to be spent. Um, but you're not going to spend money when 
investments are too risky. So I think we need to just wait and see how long this lasts for. I don't think there'll be a fundamental change to venture. Um, if I look at what happened after Lehman's um, and other crises we've happened, there is an immediate pause. And then coming out of that, you see those companies which perhaps shouldn't have survived um, do go by the wayside, but companies which can get through this situation and new companies which come out of um, this situation are great opportunities for investment. So I think depending on how long this lasts for, I, you know, I think the impact it could be three, nine, 12 months, don't know. I haven't got the crystal ball, but I think you'll see a real bounce back and turn on of the investment taps at some point in the future. Um, the key is when is that? And as a company sitting here today, can you bridge, I say bridge to that next round? Um, so can you get through the time period now so that when the taps are turned on, you're there for that investment? I think what, what and said that, I think what the survey did show, I think um, entrepreneurs will have to take a valuation reset. I think valuations, as we've all heard in the market, have been frothy recently. Um, I think there'll be a new norm for valuations. Um, that, that's probably where what I see happening in the next um, short to medium time horizon. Okay. Sorry, just to add to that, Ben, as well, I think that the difference between this time and Lehman's, you know, there is really a, a huge amount of dry powder out there. So the, the timing is the key question and how much that dry powder is used to shore up portfolio companies. And you know, a, lot of, a lot of VCs are now going through the, their portfolio assessment exercise and having to make tough decisions on whether to back potentially um, you know, some companies in their portfolio that they think might just fall by the wayside regardless of, of, of their support. So there's an element of uh, finding out how much of that dry powder is being used um, to do that sort of backing up and, you know, essentially helping their companies get over the crisis. And then when we get out of it, how much is going to be left? And I think, you know, it's all a timing thing. And the longer that we stay in this, the, the, the worse it will be, which is quite obvious to say. But if it's a short term blip, then there should be dry powder out there for there to be new investments coming, you know, to help us bounce back quite quickly, I think. Okay. Ten years have been fairly for for the industry in general for startups. I mean, people have been investments have been flourishing. So, I mean, is 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 twelve months a reasonable horizon to expect people to be able to survive, and there's still be powder dry at the end of that, or or is that maybe it's at the end of this sort of stretching it? Yeah. So, I mean, remember, I think Ed touched on at the earlier stage, VCT and EIS funds do you have cap have to deploy capital mm. um, so there will be capital to deploy it just be the number of deals will be lower yeah. um, and I think what's really interesting is going to see what this government scheme says so the government scheme is around the convertible note so it's going to be up to five million of, of bridge financing so I think we have to wait and see but yeah I mean if 12 months is tough if you need equity now equity investment and taps are turned off how do you get through that period and that is a tough question you know and all good entrepreneurs there will be making decisions around cash flow and where they can save money um, perhaps reducing the scaling plans they had and coming up with a covid case um but yeah it's it's going to be tough there's no getting away from that Fair enough. well um I think that um, that sort of looks like it answers a lot of the questions that have come in. I think um, obviously we're in sort of un uncharted territory here, um, but I think that you know out of crisis does come opportunity, and I'm sure that uh, you know everyone is. Oh, we do have another couple of questions coming in. You know, aware of the fact that um, we are in sort of tricky times, um, and everyone's sort of shifting their strategies to 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 uh, to take that into account. So hoping that it isn't a, a sort of 12 month horizon. I, I get the sense that we are probably not too far away from. A semi-return to normalcy. I suppose the question we face is whether it will re-emerge, and, and if it does, whether they'll have a vaccine by then, or you know whether we'll have some kind of immunity passports. It's so unclear what the potential, um, you know, what the, what the different sort of paths are. So it's uh, it's tricky to sort of um, to sort of navigate. We've got another question here coming in from um, 
sorry, from John. Um, we've got property investors using bridging loans commonly to flip property deals. From a business investment point of view, is it possible now to be buying smaller or startup businesses who may be cash poor now but asset rich that wouldn't survive? Is that something you can speak to? No, I'm just reading the question. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yes, but um, what is it? It's just not so bad. It's it's fundamentally what those businesses are. So, what part of the economy are they in? Um, if you are a consumer business as an investor, would you be willing to take the the risk um, of investing in a consumer business? When you don't know when the taps will be turned on um and how the economy will recover but yeah i think in any and i think you touched on it any crisis there is an opportunity so speaking to a number of investors um they are looking for opportunities and looking for good good investment really good investment opportunities at the right valuation so if you can pick up a business which it's fundamentally strong, um, but for whatever reason, COVID-19 has significantly impacted it, then they are looking at those opportunities. The entrepreneur where they might have had a valuation expectation of X, just have to realize we're in a different scenario. Fair enough. Um, and if, if people want to get in touch with, um, with you guys at the Raise team, how, how, do, they, how do they do that? To they want to have questions or they wanted to you know inquire about participating in the program. Yeah. So um, best bet is to send either either Glenn or myself an email. Okay. Um, Let me uh, the presentation. Sorry, I've, I've, I've to yeah. Share your emails here. Yeah. So the emails are just, sorry. Flick to the flick to the, the front. So um, both my uh, mine and Glenn's emails are there. So that's probably the best way to get in touch, and then we can we can take it from there. Great, and you know I've actually uh, unfortunately minimised that. So if you could just share it again for everyone, that would be helpful. Oh, sorry. Apologies. Um, Is that? It certainly sounds like um, an interesting program, and um, you know something that would be difficult for people to, you know, running their own business. Getting in touch with the breadth of, of different types of investors is obviously um, is tricky, and it sounds like. You know this uh, warm introduction certainly my experience is that is also true that mm -hmm. having uh, you know a warm introduction certainly helps um you know with with the raising of, of funding um that didn't come up in fact um sorry could you try again um, or i could just show them on the um The red technology. No, I think yes. The uh, everyone's watching Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> Is that that back on now? It's not, it hasn't come back up, but um, yeah. we could share them in the chat if that if you'd be up for that. Yeah, yeah. If, if you could share it in the chat, that'd be, that'd be yeah. fine. We've also got our website. If you go to PwC, just type PwC Rays into Google. Um, you'll have our contact details there and a bit of information around our program. Great. Um, excellent. Well, Charles, thank you very much for, for taking the time to, to join us this morning. Um, very informative and uh, great to get your insight into, into how the market's um, you know, developing. I know that there are a lot of questions around this and um, certainly we don't have a lot of clarity from the government yet, but hoping for some further clarity there and um, you know, obviously hope that the sector remains well supported because it is so important for uh, you know for, for for growth and for the future development of uh, of the, the space in the UK. So, thank you very much for for joining us this morning. We very much appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great day. Have a great day, all. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye.